Those Kings chapter number 3 tonight. And I uh, want to start reading in verse number 16. <clears throat> the Bible said, let me say this real quick before I start reading. Appreciate all the things that's done in the church. I appreciate the, those in the community that are working to organize this thing to uh, for Sister Nancy's benefit. I appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate what is done. Sister Jean takes care of these flowers. And... Uh, not because I'm too lazy to do it. She doesn't mind to do it. And if I took care of them, they probably would not flourish quite as well as they do when Sister Jean takes care of them. And uh, the people that, Sister Debbie, I think a lot of times helps, takes care of the yard mowing, and Sister Jean takes care of flowers, and, and uh, our little friend in the back back here takes care of vacuuming for us and all we have to do is push a button and she does it we don't even have to be here to monitor her but I do appreciate things that are done for the for the cause of Christ and for the gospel's sake thank you for, for your participation in keeping the church going on for the Lord 1 Kings 3 and 16 there came two women that were harlots of the king and stood before him the one woman said, Oh, my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. It came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. We were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And so she arose at midnight, took my son from beside me, while thine handmaid slept, laid it in her bosom, laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, thy son that is dead. The other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. The king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then spake the woman, whose the living child was, unto the king. For her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O my Lord, give her the living child. In no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it neither be mine nor thine, but divide it. The king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that in the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. I suppose probably on Mother's Day Sunday, this scripture setting here was probably read in multiple places across our land. And uh, it's often used uh, in a Mother's Day type setting. These two women here were uh, harlots, so they weren't uh, of the greatest social standing. They were not godly women. They were mothers. Now, I'm not preaching about Mother's Day. But I want you to look into this story with me tonight. we got two women in a house and two babies in the house. There's nobody else there. They, they both seem to be uh, adamant about the fact that there was no other stranger in the house with us. There's no one else who could have done anything to these children. We were alone in the house. Me and her. They're standing before the king and they're making their case there. One of them is clutching a dead baby. One of them is clutching a live baby. And the lot of the king is to determine to who belongs the dead and to who belongs the living. But verse number 19 says, that, okay, you got to remember here. The mean woman who wants to divide the baby the mean woman who is causing all this trouble, she's got some problems, okay? So we're, we're like a DHS panel tonight, 
And for just a few minutes to lay a foundation, we're going to kind of dissect these women's socio sociopathic problems, okay? The woman who's wanting to divide the baby, the woman whose child is dead, the woman who, the Bible said, overlaid her child. I can't even imagine. I know that as, as we became parents, we were very young, of course, and and uh, our children began to come along in our marriage. God thought, I mean, Benjamin first and Brianna. And we were young parents. We didn't know how to do everything. We got a lot of advice, probably most of it from people who did not have children. And, and, and some advice we got from people who weren't even married. That seemed to know what we need to do with our children. But one thing I know is that no matter how sound that I slept, no matter how sound that Sister Jennifer was asleep, if those babies so much as twitched, in the crib. She knew it. There was a natural gas explosion that blew a building up on 66 Highway going into Sepulpa right by uh, Brianna where they're building that, rebuilding that old outdoor theater and the golf course on this side. There's a, a uh, body shop there that was a, a big block building. Had a natural gas explosion blew that building up and blew up so loud that it rattled the windows in our home. Shook the house. I didn't know it. There was a tornado that came through several years ago and blew so much it turned my uncle's stock trailer upside down. It blew a barn over. It caused all kind of trouble. And he called me the next morning and said, how's everything out your way? I said, great, I guess. He said, y'all get any damage from the wind? I said, what wind? There was a tornado that came through. The sirens went off. The alarms went off. Everybody went to the cellar. I just slept through it all. Enjoying my life. Those babies could cry, and Mama knew it immediately. A lot of times she could be out of bed and grabbing that child and, and, and beginning to take care of it, do whatever the child needed, what they needed, uh, whether it was time to eat or whether they needed a change or whether they needed to be rocked, they fell, uh, you know, uh, fell over against the edge of the crib and bumped their head or whatever it was. She knew that. That's, that's part of being a mama. I can tell you tonight that no matter how sound I slept, no matter how many babies cries I slept through, she never slept through one. Those children cried out, she knew that. Even in the soundness of sleep, but this woman, that this first one in verse number 19, she said she overlaid her child. She she didn't just, you know, rip its head off. She didn't stab it, she didn't poison it. She was sleeping so sound as she flopped herself over on top of that baby. And that little child, no doubt, kicking, jerking, convulsing, suffocated to death and died under the weight of its mother's body. Would you agree with me tonight during our DHS sociology panel here that that mama was sleeping too soundly? Amen. Everybody agree with that? Sister Debbie, you are the only mother and grandmother, both, in the building. You agree with that, that that mama slept too sound? And so, so she slept sound enough that she overlays her child and suffocates it to death. I mean, if I lay over and Sister Jennifer's pillow is moved and it's in my way and I'm over and I, and I, and I can't, I mean, it wakes me up. If, if her foot is there, if I lay over anything in the bed, I know it. I, it wakes me up. But this woman sleeps so sound that she overlaid another human even if the child was a preemie and it only weighed three pounds, still, how in this world does a mother overlay a child and suffocate it to death and never even realize it's happening? Oh God. Eventually she wakes up. She realizes I'm squashing my child. We put a divider in our hog house as we were children growing up. My dad had several sows and we raised show pigs and we sold them to people around. People came from Indiana and Michigan and all over the United States to buy show hogs for my dad. We had quite a little operation there. We had a divider down those farin crates where the sow would not overlay the piglets. If you didn't have that, I don't know a pig and get to rubbing herself on the side of the Pig, uh, the pig house and scratching herself and, and next thing you know boy she flops all 500 pounds down or however much she weighed and she mashed those babies but humans are better than that or they're supposed to be 
So this mother wakes up and realizes I've squashed my child. And so she goes, now, now remember, the one who killed her child and stole the other one, she's pretty bad. She wants that other one to get divided. She doesn't mind hacking it up with a sword. But I want to look at the other mother, who's we preached about, and men, I mean, Mother's Day, they'll, they will herald this other woman. They'll all forget that she's a harlot. They'll all forget that there was no father in the picture at all. Father's Day would have just been to whom it may concern in the, in the classified section in the newspaper, I guess, because there was no daddy here. And we'll make this woman out to be the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 on Mother's Day because she said, don't divide the baby. But I want you to notice something about her. She slept so sound that that living child, she's cuddling up. You all know what cuddling is? Snuggling, you all know, you know what that is, don't you? Jennifer get the babies and she'd snuggle them up, cuddle them up close to her and sleep. This woman, who we make out to be a patron saint of motherhood, slept so sound that the murderer took her baby out of her bosom and put it to the side and then replaced it with a dead baby. So, I can't tell you tonight, yes, when it comes time to divide them, one seems to shine more than the other. But in their slumber, one of them is just as bad as the other one. Y'all all agree with that tonight? Amen. Sister Jennifer would have never overlaid a baby. And I promise you one thing. She may not be that big. She's not as big as me. And she's not as tough as me. But you would have never taken one of our children from the grasp of her arms and replaced it with a plastic baby doll or a dead infant without that little red-headed woman coming unglued on you. <laughs> Sleeping is necessary. Sleep is important to health, to mental stability, as long as it's at the right time. But sleep in its improper place is deadly. Sound sleep costs this baby its life. Sound sleep almost cost the other baby its life. Mm -hmm. Except the real mother swept in there and changed it right there at the end and, and gave us a little good mama picture of her. But as far as in the bed that night, these two women and two babies. And I can't tell you that one of them shines any better than the other. The Bible tells us a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hand to sleep. Proverbs said like this, Consider and hear me, Lord, O Lord my God, and lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Medical, medical doctors say that there is a sleep epidemic in America going on right now. 40% of Americans get less than six hours of sleep a night. 22 million plus Americans suffer with obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea or OSA increases your risk of death and disease greatly. A sleep disorder can kill you. A sleep disorder will lessen your life expectancy by up to 75%. Just by not getting enough rest. The risk of heart failure increases by 140% with sleep apnea. The risk of stroke increases by 60% with sleep apnea. 83% of all Americans who suffer with type 2 diabetes also suffer unknowingly from a sleep disorder. So sleep is important. If you don't get enough rest, you know it. When we've done the state testing in school, Teachers always gave us out a little paper and they gave a little talk, you know, and told us make sure to eat a good breakfast before you come to school in the morning. Make sure your child gets enough rest because we're doing the Iowa State testing. We want everybody to make a good grade on the test. And sleep is important to passing a test properly. When you don't have the right amount of sleep, it makes you uh, slow to react to things. It causes, a, it causes an insufficiency physically. 
It causes an insufficiency. Mentally, you're not at yourself if you don't sleep right. I, several years ago, was diagnosed with sleep apnea. I use a CPAP machine every night. My dad uses a BiPAP machine that also has oxygen as well as forced air. I use that sleep machine every night. If I don't use it, if I sit down in a chair and take a nap on Sunday afternoon, for instance, and I don't put that machine on, I'll snore, I'll gurgle, I'll gasp, my heart will stop, my body will go into convulsions. Sometimes I wake up mentally, but my body won't wake up. And I begin to have those apneas, and what happens is your heart stops. And, 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 you, and you cease to live. What happens is, Brother Junior, you're dying. I've suffered with that for years. I wear that sleep machine, and Addison prays, and I used to pray every night. I guess she still does. Pray about every day for God to heal me where I won't have to wear that, what she calls my night night machine anymore. Sister Jennifer has suffered with sleep disorders, and she doesn't wear one of those machines, not the same, but she talks in her sleep. She moves in her sleep. She did it last night. <laughs> and, and she'll wake up in the night and holler and jump and scream and carry on. Lack of sleep is dangerous. But too much sleep is dangerous too. Yes. The balance is the key. Yes. Some years ago we were asleep one night. And all of a sudden in the middle of the night I'm sound asleep. I'm off in another land, you know, in Dreamville or whatever. And all of a sudden, Jennifer jumps straight up in the bed and hollers, Ah, there's a man. I came awake. Immediately when I heard that, she's screaming, Honey, there's a man. There's a man in our room. So I jerk open the nightstand drawer. I pull out a little snub nose 357, come up over the side of that bed like a mix of John Wayne and Rambo all at the same time. And I'm telling you, I'm looking. I'm trying to get my eyes, and I can't, I can't see. I said, honey, I can't see him. Where's he at? He's right there. Where's he at? Right there. Man, here I am with a gun. If one of our kids would have come in there wanting something, I'd have blown him into eternity. All I can imagine is there's some murderer, some guy with a hatchet hanging over our bed, fixing to hack us to death, and I can't see him. She's sitting up in the bed screaming. Hysterically, I've got my gun. I'm rubbing my eyes, man. I'm telling you, I'm looking for somebody to shoot. I'm trying to defend my family. And all I finally see something. I think, all right, there he is. And I get down on it and get a look and realize it's my it's my shirt and pants that I'd hung up on the on the opening before I went to bed. And I'm fixing to kill it. I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, my heart was pounding. My temples were pounding. I was wide awake, but my eyes was blurry. And I'm telling you, I was, I mean, I was scared to death. Honey, where are they at? Where are they at? Where are they at? And all of a sudden she goes, mm -hmm. calls over on her pillow. Sister Jean sound asleep. Next morning she didn't remember anything. She said, I never done that. Oh, well, yes, you did too. I don't remember it. One night we're sound asleep, and all of a sudden in the middle of the night, I'm instantly cold. I wake up, set up in the bed, and she's walking down the hallway to the living room with all the covers off the bed over her shoulder. It's walking down the hallway. I'm laying there in the bed, freezing to death, and I holler, what are you doing? What are you doing? I chased her down, caught her in the hallway. Her eyes are open, and she's not focusing. I said, honey, 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 and finally, you know, don't fall out with me. I don't just use that as an opportunity to box her, but I, I had to. I said, honey, honey, honey. Finally, she woke her. She said, why are we down here? What are you doing? I said, you got out of bed and took off with the covers. What are you doing? She said, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't know I did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. And so we go back and get in the bed, try to get the covers fixed. And we can't go back to sleep. Sleep disorders are dangerous. Sleep disorders, sleeping too sound, not sleeping enough. These two women here, there's a little child that died because his mama slept so sound that she rolled over and smashed him in his sleep. A little fellow that had no idea what was going on. I want to tell you something tonight. We're living in a sleepy world. Yes. We're living in a sleepy church world. Amen. People, people are asleep. They don't seem to realize what's going on. Jennifer told me years ago, she said, you can't hold me responsible for anything that happens when I'm asleep. I said, okay. <laughs> it's been pretty debatable since then. 
At Mount Tabor camp meeting some years ago, we were staying up in the parsonage. Brother Dan and Sister Betty were pastoring there. And, and Brother Dan had asked me to preach each one of the youth services that year, so I was preaching every evening. That morning in a morning service, his son-in-law, Brother Stanley Cockrell, had preached about people being awakened in the night to pray and about, you know, your willingness to seek God at any time. And so, Brother Dan said, I'm going to leave one light on in the tabernacle. I want to ask you that are staying here to pray for God to move on you in the night. And when He touches your heart, people just come and go out of the tabernacle. Let's just pray through this meeting see what God will do. Well, I was getting up every night, 2, 3, 4 in the morning. I'd get up and I'd go down to the tabernacle. Sometimes there was no one there. Sometimes there was two or three. I'd pray a little bit and come back. I come back one night, I opened the door, came back, moved the cover to get in the bed. Jennifer pulled the cover back up and said, who is it? I said, it's me. I pulled the cover back, she pulled it back up around her neck and she said, who is me? I said, it's me. Again, I went and sat down, she blocks me, pulls the cover back up. I moved the cover back and I said, honey, it's me. She said, who is me? I said, it's your husband, Goofy. Move over and let me in the bed. And the next morning, she didn't have any idea anything had happened. She sleep was so sound, she didn't have a conversation. We was in a hotel preaching in, in, in Tennessee. And Ben and Brianna and Addison were in one bed, and he and Jennifer in the other bed. All of a sudden, uh, uh, Jennifer, in the middle of the night, sits straight up in the bed and hollers, Friday night fellowship. And Benjamin sits up in the bed. He's got the same thing. He sits up in the bed and hollers. Me and Brianna sit up and look at each other and go back to the next morning. Nobody knows nothing about it. Sleep is something that you need. If you're not getting enough rest, you need to. But I want to talk to you about the other side of that. Sleep too much in the wrong times is so dangerous. Sleep spiritually is deadly. Sleep is dangerous. Sleep take a deadly turn and can claim your life. Sleep at the wrong time can claim the life of others. All because you're too drowsy. 60% of adults were, were, that, that were polled in a poll by our government, 60% of American adults said, admitted that they drive repetitively when they are drowsy. 60% of them of drive drowsy. I mean, there's a lot of money spent every year about mothers against drunk driving. And we teach children at school. I'm sure they do it up here. Don't drive drunk. If you get intoxicated, call your friend. Call somebody to come and get you. But we don't hear a lot about driving drowsy. 2017, the National Highway Traffic Society Administration said that 91,000 wrecks on American highways are due to people driving while drowsy. 50,000 people were hospitalized in 2017 due to drowsy driving and accidents. There were 800 deaths in those 91,000 accidents in 2017. 21% of all traffic accidents in the United States of America are as a result of a drowsy driver. Praise God. I'll tell you something tonight. Driving drowsy spiritually is going to get you into trouble after a while. If all you do is sit in church and snooze and sleep and you're not awake and alert spiritually, I'm telling you it costs the life of these children. It costs the life of 800 people in 2017. It hospitalized 50,000 people in the United States. you imagine the medical bills across America that had mounted up all because people drove while they were drowsy. And I'm seeing a church world today of people who are so drowsy spiritually. They're lulled to sleep. Everything's good. Nothing's going wrong. My health isn't in too bad of a shape. I got plenty of financial security. The church isn't doing too terrible. We're holding our own. We're doing this. We're doing that. I'm telling you, sleep deprivation spiritually. When people come in and they begin to get sleep and they're sleep spiritually, they're not praying. They're not reading. They're not alert. That's why Peter said be sober and be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary is going about seeking who he may devour. Brother, listen. We need rest in our body and our mind and our spirit, but we need to be awake in the Lord. Yes, amen. The book of Romans tells us Romans chapter number 13. The 
Bible instructs us some more about sleep. The Bible said, and now knowing the time, it's high time to awake out of sleep. For our salvation is nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let's cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting, drunkenness, chambering, wanting a strive and envy. But put on the Lord and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. It's high time to wake up. We're living in a church world where people are asleep. The agenda of some who have got into high places in our government is to cause the work of God to cease in this nation. There's people that have an agenda. All this mess with gas prices, all this mess with economic uh, instability, all this mess with lumber prices, and, and all this stuff going on with the interest rates going up and down, there's an agenda behind that. Those things don't happen by accident. Hey, Amen. There's people in America tonight that are militant. They are awake. They are sober. They are vigilant. And they're working against the church. Hey, Amen. They want to stop us from preaching in the name of Jesus. They want to stop us from worshiping. Hey, Amen. Brother, I'm telling you, we're living in an hour of all asleep uh, and they're drowsy and they're nodding off uh, when we need to be away. Oh God, help Thank us, God. Jesus. Souls are being lost. Jesus. Men and women are dying lost without God. And a lot of times it's just simply because the church went to sleep. Are you awake spiritually? Help us. Ephesians 5 and 14 said, Wherefore he, God, says, Awake thou that sleepest. Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Praise the Lord. Just as much as I need rest in my body, I get out on the road, like I was the other day, 15 and a half hours, and I come crashing in the house about 11.30, 11.45 at night. I didn't hardly miss it. I hugged Jennifer, hugged the girls, went to bed. I had to get rest. Yes. But spiritually, we've got a lot of people that are sleep deprived naturally. Because they're getting all their sleep spiritually. Are you awake enough to realize what's going on around you? Are you awake enough to realize, are we, are we dealing with people in the church society today, like these two women in 1 Kings chapter 3, have, have souls that God trusted to our care been overlaid by us in a stupor of spiritual slumber? Has souls been stolen out of our bosom? Have you been trusted to the care of some man, woman, boy, or girl that God put the burden on you but you were so asleep you didn't pray? You were so asleep you never fasted? You didn't go, you didn't remember you weren't faithful, you didn't do anything about it. And the devil slips in. But I'm telling you, it's more serious than the baby getting overlaid. It's more serious than the baby getting stolen. And that we need to be awake spiritually and realize we've got an adversary that's stealing things from our churches and stealing from us and he's taking people to hell. We need to be awake. Don't fall asleep in the last days. Don't let the devil rock you to sleep. Praise God. He's got a way of doing it. He's got a way. I heard a preacher say one time, <laughs> preaching, he said, some of my church people get their greatest rest during my sermons. Praise God. I fell asleep in church. I have sat in church right here and been so wore out and exhausted. Been to fellowship meeting or revivals and whatever. And Sunday morning sat here and Sister Jean's teaching us. And I start feeling bad because I realize my eyes are getting blurry. I've had to get up and go to the back and get a drink because I don't want to go to sleep in the house of God. But not just falling asleep and not off on the pew. Ben fell asleep one night. Or one Sunday morning at Brother Larry Dyer's church in Galilee, all of his church down in Danielsville, around Danielsville, Georgia. He's sitting on the end of the pew from us, about like where Brother Junior is, we're on this end. Sunday school teachers teaching away. Brother Larry's sitting over there on the side, everybody just, I mean, just Sunday school class going. Amen. In a little while, I noticed people looking, noticed people smiling. Sister Debbie, I looked down the end of the row, and Ben was slumped plumb over. And in a little bit, we kind of bumped the seat, and he goes, oh. And kind of snorted himself back away. And the Sunday school teacher heard it. It's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to fall asleep in church. 
I don't want to fall asleep while I'm driving. We just come back from lecture camp meeting years ago. Me and Jennifer both wore out. I went to sleep somewhere between Midwest City and where we were going to get off at Cromwell and go up 48 Highway to my in-laws and spend the night that night. It was way in the early morning hours. I dozed off. She was asleep driving. Our children were babies. She was asleep. I told her, go ahead and get some. I think I'm all right. Well, I wasn't all right. All of a sudden, I woke up coming down I 40. I was in my lane. I mean, I was on my side of the road, but I was over here on the rumblies, you know. And I woke up and heard that thing going off. And I sat up and I saw a big sign that said Earlsboro. I'd never heard of Earlsboro in my life. I didn't know where I was, I didn't know what state I was in. I was completely, totally asleep. I had to stop. On the side of the road, open my my uh, dear my sun visor and open the little map light up and get my Rand McNally map out that Brother Ralph Campbell had got for us and find Earlsboro to find out where I was. I didn't even know where I was at. I've never heard of Earlsboro. I've been in Oklahoma all my life. Brother, I'm telling you, if you fall asleep on your Christian journey, you're liable to end up in a ditch. You're liable to end up upside down in a creek. You're liable to end up head on in the oncoming traffic. And then you better wake up spiritually and realize we're in a dark hour. We're at a sleeping time. And that men and women are being lulled to sleep by the things in the world. And they're losing out. Don't fall asleep in your spirit. Praise yeah, God. Get ready to sing, baby. I'll tell you, sleep, as I begin to read some of those things, some of those statistics, 21%. I don't know. I didn't read on. See, how much the percentage is of accidents that are attributed to alcohol abuse. I don't know. I don't know how much. There, there is a percentage, I'm sure, and it's probably large. There's also a percentage of wrecks that are attributed to substance abuse, to methamphetamines, and various things like that. But 21%, you realize that's almost one-fourth? Almost a fourth, and it may be worse now. Almost a fourth of the accidents in the United States of America alone are from people who drove while they were drowsy. Listen, we're driving spiritually. You're not sitting still. We're not, we're not holding our own. We're either going forward or we're going backwards. One or the other. We're not just sitting still on the side of the highway. We're not in neutral spiritually. Somebody said, well, I'm not really making any progress. I'm not driving. You know, I'm just kind of coasting along. No, you're not. You may be sound asleep with your foot on the gas and your car in drive and you don't even know where you're at, but you're not just sitting in neutral. People fall asleep at the wheel. Some years ago, we were coming back from church one night. I saw car lights, saw the running lights on the top of a one-ton pickup. Way, way down a steep hill. In the bottom of a ravine in a creek, I knew there wasn't anything down there but brush. I stopped, turned around, went back. A Baptist preacher, an elderly gentleman, pulled up on the side of the road as well, saw that I had stopped to see if I needed help. I was standing beside the road in a suit and a white shirt. He stopped and said, Preacher, is everything okay? I said, yeah. I said, listen, there's a truck down in here in the bottom of this thing. I'm telling you, it was way, I can show you, it was way down there. I said, if you'll stay here with my wife and babies, I said, I'll go down that hill and see what's wrong. I laid down on my back and slid straight down that embankment. Waded through that creek over to that vehicle. It was still idling. Sitting in that creek. As I turned around and looked, there was a great big cottonwood tree right there on the side of the highway that was split in half like this. And I could see the tracks where that truck had left the highway and went off. Slid down in there, way to that creek, crawled up to that pickup through the brush and the mess, my suit, breeches, and white shirt, and twisted under the seat and over in the back and around everything in there was a 36 year old Marine that fell asleep at the wheel and died, crashed that pickup and killed himself. I ended up later, a week or so after that, preaching his funeral. The family had no minister. The funeral home called and asked me, would I come and take care of the funeral? And Jennifer and I went preached his graveside service that they had for him. He died because he fell asleep. I'm telling you, we're, we're dealing with people in our church world that are so asleep spiritually, they don't even realize what the devil's doing to them. They don't realize he's took their baby out of their bosom. They don't realize they've overlaid one and killed it. People don't even realize what's happening when they get into a state of slumber so deep that they have no idea what's going on. Just a few short years ago, right here in Oklahoma, just a few miles over here across the line.
family was asleep one night and an intruder broke in the home. The parents' bedroom was at the front of the hallway. The intruder went down the hall and killed and kidnapped, killed some children and kidnapped some more. And the parents had no idea until the next morning, Sister Gail, when they got up to go to work and went to wake the kids up to go to school and some of them were laying in their bed with their throats cut and some of them were missing and realized an intruder had came in the front door and went right by mom and dad's bedroom. He said, well, they wouldn't do that to me. They wouldn't do that to me. Evidently, they were sleeping too soundly. We've got people sitting in church that are so asleep spiritually that they don't even realize how off that they are. The devil comes in, comes right down our hallway and takes things that are precious to us while we have slept. The Bible said it like this. I'll try to close with this scripture. The tares that grew up in that field. And the farmer knew he didn't plant those tares. He planted wheat in that field. But there's tares there now. And when the questions were raised, how did those get there? You know what they said? An enemy hath done this. How and when? The questions asked. And he said, while men slept. I wanted to warn us tonight to get away. Every one of us have family members around us that are lost without God. We've got backslid friends. We've got backslid family members. We know people that if they die tonight, they're going to be lost. Don't go to sleep. You can't afford it. What if the rumblings wake me up? Well, bless your heart, they did me. But they may not wake you up. You may cross the center line. And the rumblings may not wake you up. You may go headlong into traffic and lose your soul because you fell asleep at the wheel spiritually. Don't drive drowsy. That's my message for you tonight. I know, I know, I know. But all you ever heard, honey, you ready? All you ever heard is don't drive drunk. Don't drive drunk. Don't drive drunk. I've never been drunk in my life. I've never had a drink. I have, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't do that. I've never done that. But I've got behind the wheel and put my life in danger and her life in danger and my children's life and everybody else I'm in because I drove drowsy. So I'm warning you tonight as a pastor of the church, physically, don't drive drowsy. If you're asleep, if you're too sleepy to drive, get a nap. Don't drive drowsy. Please, spiritually, don't fall asleep on the wheel. We can't afford another casualty. I don't want to be a statistic to you. Let's stand tonight. God, I appreciate your message and grace. Thank you for your mercy. I hope I've done justice to 